In the latter half of the 19th century, shortly after the Civil War was determined victorious by the Union, labor movements started popping up everywhere. It turns out fighting a war over negative labor conditions makes a lot of people realize that their labor conditions aren't ideal. In 1866, the National Labor Union was formed. According to Britannica.com, it was founded explicitly as a rejection of the current dogma at the time. They sought to make changes in labor conditions not by bargaining with individual employers, but by getting a national legislative movement in progress. While the union did exist for only seven years, it ended up having 500,000 members at its peak, showing how it was culturally relevant at the time. And here's where one of the biggest divides in American politics began, and why the NLU isn't really memorized today. They were opposed to labor strikes, strongly. They believed that workers and owners had shared interests, as opposed to the common day narrative where workers and owners are in constant conflict with each other and that wage labor in and of itself is in some ways exploitative. In 1872, they turned from a regular organization into a political party and put one of their top guys, David Davis, into running for president. They failed and stopped existing almost immediately, being relegated to more of a historical footnote than something that is taught in modern day classes. While in the short term they may have been more popular with the common man, by the end they were not really remembered because they didn't fit the structure of a political movement. Typically things that are remembered are short, snappy, and uncontroversial, as opposed to a large statement which can easily be construed or misconstrued by those who oppose you. Over the long term, the things that make history are shared public opinions that people can disagree with and know why. Which brings us to the Knights of Labor. The Knights were a secret society founded in 1869 by Uriah Stevens. Initially, he shared similar goals to the NLU, being against strikes because things needed to change at a more national level to really have a difference on anyone's day-to-day -day life. According to History.com, his story started when everyone at the local garment cutters union disbanded. He invited as many people as possible to his home so that they could discuss a plan for the future. Over the next decade, they grew and grew and accepted basically anyone into their ranks as long as they could be trusted not to snitch. The only people they didn't recruit were members of the ruling class, lawyers, bankers, etc. In 1879, Arias stepped down and was replaced by Terence Powderly, the most 19th century human to ever exist. In 1881, he even announced that women would be allowed to join the union something remarkably forward-thinking for the time. While in the short term this was scandalous, in the 21st century we look back on it as a moment of progress. The Knights were even more forward-thinking than many people are today. They advocated for ideas that are still wildly outside of the purview of American politics, including, but not limited to, the end of convict labor, nationalization of the local communication networks, and companies owned by employees instead of by bosses who might not even show up to the building they work in. These are still seen as preposterous today, but they were also right about a lot of things back then. They have a solid track record of being ahead of their time, maybe we just haven't caught up to them yet. Or at least that's what I would say if they weren't incredibly racist. But unlike most racist organizations of the time, it wasn't against black people, but instead against Asians. Black people were welcomed as strong laborers, while Asians were viewed as low-level laborers trying to steal American jobs. The things that they said about Asian people are the same thing that people are saying about Mexicans today. However, in the 80s and 90s, Asians shifted from being a regular minority to a model minority showed in pop culture as forward-thinking or even above the average intelligence. It's still racism, but it fits the needs of the time period it's in using the different current issues. In 1884, the Knights pulled off their biggest move yet, with the Union Pacific Railroad strike. After cutting 10% off of every worker's paychecks, they stopped every railroad from Nebraska to Utah. And after just a few more days, they got their paychecks restored. But after the Haymarket Square riot of 1886, the Union disbanded and was more or less forgotten. The Haymarket Riot is actually an interesting case study because of the way that the Knights were treated in the aftermath. At a relatively peaceful protest in Chicago, speakers were talking about what the eight-hour workday was and why it should be put into federal law. While the protest was entirely peaceful, the police were still standing by in case something went wrong, despite the fact the right to protest is engraved in the Constitution. Only after everyone had left at around 10.30 p.m., the rain had picked up, everyone could leave, the speaker had finished and people were just mingling, then the police moved in and ordered everyone to leave, a blatantly unconstitutional act. Then, someone, we don't know who, threw a bomb, and we don't know who, but the police immediately opened indiscriminate fire upon the crowd. But it was dark and rainy because everyone had left, so they were mostly shooting each other. Only one police officer was killed by the bomb, but by the end of the night, seven police and four protesters were dead, with up to 70 injured. The way the media reported on the incident was heavily skewed in favor of the police, portraying the protesters as nothing more than an angry, violent mob. 
with the police protecting. In the short term, we saw this as a moment of police saving American democracy. In the modern day, we have more information about the events, but you probably haven't heard of them because they aren't taught. What is taught is that American Labor Day is in September, even though this event that was the day's founding was on May 4th. Over the long term, the government tends to ignore things that make them look bad. In December of 1886, the American Federation of Labor was formed, and really just destroyed any momentum that the Knights might have still had. In fact, the AFL would continue to be the driving force in all of the future years to come. Wait, that's all the time we have.